year, the World Economic Forum's annual summit over the years has been the big push towards renewable power. India has been amongst the leaders in that. And I'm going to talk to a company that's been amongst the leaders in India and now, of course, also internationally listed, Renew Power and Suman Sinha. Suman, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're in a curious state in the world right now because coal seems to be making a comeback. Even whilst the focus and the push on renewable energy uh, you know, is, is being doubled down upon, not just by countries like India, which has had an ambitious target, but also now much of Europe, which is moving very, very quickly. So how would you characterize this energy policy shift that you see taking place across the world? Yeah, Minika, that's a great question. Actually, you know, up till now, the focus um, to uh, have faster growth in renewables was really driven by climate change, uh, and the fact that renewables had become very competitive, that was making the adoption of renewables a lot easier. There were issues around the phasing out of coal and uh, how to make the transition happen in a somewhat seamless manner, right? And how technology is evolving. What's happened with as a result of the recent developments geopolitically is that um, now there's a much larger focus on energy security. Right. And that is beginning to really, in the short run at least, uh, bring a very different dimension to the conversation on, on energy. Now people are wondering how can they replace gas uh, faster, uh, especially coming in from Russia in Europe. Um, and um, that's of course pushed the prices of all fossil fuels up as well. So every country is now grappling with this issue and particularly European companies and European countries are really dealing with this issue in a, in sort of an, on an emergency basis. And decisions that they take will now have an impact on the rest of the world as well in terms of energy pricing and so on. So we all have to watch very carefully what actually happens in Europe. So in the short run, it may very well be that Europe pushes forward a little bit on fossil fuel capacities to make up for the shortfall of, of Russian gas. But longer term, there is going to be a much deeper focus and stronger focus on renewables because people realize that you don't want to make any large scale investment decisions in fossil fuels, which will then be things that you're stuck with for the next 20, 25 years. So the effort is right now to push forward wherever there is excess capacity without too much capex in fossil fuels mm -hmm. and medium term figure out how to push forward on renewables even faster. Okay, without taking away the critical importance of renewables mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, as mm -hmm. you already explained, do you think that in the medium term, some of the prioritization that renewables has gotten could come down because of this energy security issue, uh, we're finally seeing crude pricing or fossil fuel pricing at a level where reinvestment or new investment can mm -hmm. be encouraged uh, because supply has been so constrained over the last several years and lower prices has meant no new investments in new wells, etc. So that becomes then a bigger part of the mix. Mm -hmm. The second thing is I think there is a lot of debate now on nuclear power as well that's re-emerged across the yeah. world as becoming an important uh, contributor to the mix of uh, energy security. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's coal, uh, you yeah. know, uh, again yeah. important for India. We're seeing shortages uh, and we're, you know, trying to figure out how to mm -hmm. mitigate some of that. So do you feel that maybe in the medium term, the, the, the focus on renewables might get uh, become a little bit more muted? I don't think so. I think, see, the, the reality is that we have to replace an existing source of energy, which was a lot of gas, right? Now, where are we going to get that from? So, as I said, in the short run, they are going to push forward on wherever there is uh, excess capacity in any part of the energy uh, manufacturing or creation or generation system, right? If that happens to be in fossil fuels, people will try to push that a little bit to solve the short term problem. But I don't think that companies will make long-term bets on fossil fuels right now because the payback on a lot of these oil, or, you know, oil investments is 20, 25 years. Right. And people know that maybe to solve a short-term problem for the next two to three years, to invest for some, into something that will take 20, 25 years to pay back is not a very smart choice. So therefore, they're not going to make rapid or huge amounts of new investments. But behind that, there is a very fundamental... There's a very interesting question, actually, which is all these oil and gas companies which are making these windfall profits right now, how should they use that that extra money right at this point in time? Should they give it back to their shareholders? Yeah. Should they reinvest that into, as you said, to invest you know, in new oil capacity? Or should they invest that in generating new renewable energy technology? So that's a question that oil companies globally will have to ask themselves. I think as far as nuclear is concerned, 
of course i think when we are when we have an issue where we have to sort of taken all of the, all of the all, all of the above kind of an approach nuclear is one thing that also will be looked at and especially small nuclear to the extent that it is somewhat viable i think some some people are going to try to see if that solution also works out but in addition to that the other technologies that will evolve are things like direct air capture of carbon okay. uh, uh, and then sequestration of carbon so i think those technologies will also see their place in the sun as it were because ultimately that will allow you to burn more fossil fuels uh, and hydrogen well. and of course green hydrogen is a, is a no brainer of course uh, that's something that is actually going to increase the footprint of renewable en- uh, you know energy into the broader energy ecosystem because today renewable en- energy is really renewable electricity mm-hmm. and deals with maybe 20% of the total energy basket mm-hmm. but in the form of green hydrogen uh, because you need renewable energy to make green hydrogen it really has a much bigger potential addressable market because through green hydrogen you can, you can get into use cases around mobility around uh, replacement of gas wherever green hydrogen is used as a feedstock all of those areas can be replaced and that's an additional very large market size as well so in short you don't see the growth momentum for renewable energy and when i say renewable just yeah. to make it clear for our audience because yeah. these these words can be so broad sometimes mm-hmm. i'm talking about wind and solar right uh, you, you I'm, i'm not talking about hydro yeah. wind and solar you don't see the growth momentum in any of these slowing down in the short medium and definitely not in the long term yeah. at all right i i don't see that in fact the questions that are now being raised is how can we ramp up renewables even more certainly it's a very pertinent question here in europe uh the issue is that they can't ramp it up fast enough and therefore how do you fill the gap and that's what the conversation we were having earlier um but the other question that are now emerging is that look at renewable energy the world as a whole has a um, has a dependence on uh, a single country and therefore how supply can we chain. diversify supply China. chains yes. and so on right so how can we do that and then i think india has this great opportunity to become that plus one in the pli scheme through the pli scheme or even even otherwise just given the size and scale of the domestic indian market right. it allows us to set up capacities in india and potentially supply to the rest of the world as well and so i think that is something that is a unique opportunity for yeah. india at this point in time so those conversations around the adjacencies of renewable energy enlarging the mark the sort of the value chain of renewable energy and those are the conversations that now that are now happening more and more okay uh, i'll come back to you know uh, the adjacencies of renewable energy and the investments in that space but before that i'm a bit perplexed about mm-hmm. the profit potential of renewable mm-hmm. energy and when i say that i mean that you know in india it was relatively easy over a period of time mm-hmm. to understand uh, because of the way ppas were structured etc mm-hmm. what conventional energy meant in mm. terms of profitability yes of course there was the discom problem and all mm. of that and then you know dues to generators mm. and but in renewable energy it's been very difficult to assess whether renewable energy companies are genuinely profitable or have scope to be on the path mm-hmm. to profitability i'm not talking specifically renew mm-hmm. can you talk us through how you yeah. see this pan out yeah sure look, what is the best yeah. way an investor should be looking yeah. at this so look i think uh, in renewable energy it's very easy to make wrong choices and make wrong bets and get into large investments that ultimately do not yield uh, more than cost of capital and in fact may yield below cost of capital um having said that at the same time you have to keep in mind that renewable energy ultimately is an infrastructure business right. which creates hard assets and in those kinds of businesses you don't make 40 50% returns you make maybe 16 17 maybe 20% returns if you're very lucky and if you execute very well and if you don't execute well maybe you'll make less than 10% so i mean that's really the the range within which most companies will tend to operate and if cost of capital in india is let's say um, 11 or 12% then you could be either higher or lower depending on how well you execute for capital providers the trick is to find out the people who are able to be relatively disciplined about making these investments not getting carried away in bidding aggressively uh, low numbers just to win capacity so i think that is the the you know the sensibility or the sense that uh, uh, people have to look for in uh, in people who are in investing in the sector but uh, we have seen over the last two or three years very aggressive bidding when it comes to solar power projects yeah. as a result of which the pricing of power in these yeah. projects has come down to rock bottom it's also led to some states then you know reneging on previous contracts etc yeah. so uh, i think my my concern here is a uh, in some ways will this go the way of conventional energy 
we had that ppa problem occur yeah. you know several years ago yeah. in conventional energy and b uh, are these prices yeah. of solar power yeah. viable you know as i said there is a very thin margin between making decent returns and making below cost of capital returns so we're at about 2 bucks now no we are actually a little bit higher than that because now gst has been increased on solar okay and uh, because we now have also a customs duty on import of solar modules right and inherently solar module prices globally have gone up so actually now rates are between 230 and 250 something but the last rate. bids were yeah no they were yeah, even yeah. lower than 2 in some cases no no there right? was only one bid that went down to 199 correct uh, but that was a while ago since then gst has come in and this customs duty has come in as well and so therefore tariffs have actually gone up somewhat uh, but you know the kind of uh, reduction that you saw earlier i think that is going to be a little bit tough to replicate because the commodity prices have just gone up across the board right and uh, even for wind in fact uh, and actually for all energy so i think you'll see uh, renewable energy prices go up a little bit as well so you're saying that bids will come back to a, a some form of viable level Uh, for projects to sustain over no but the time. higher tariff doesn't mean more viability right because it's ultimately a question cost of, of tariff versus the cost, cost of, of capital. capital and the capex itself right. right so if the capex itself has gone out uh, so to me the tariff but a itself tariff is the star- is a, is a negative necess- starting point no, no? not necessarily it depends okay. on where the capex and the module prices are okay so by itself a lower tariff or a higher tariff does not guarantee returns right it's a question of what the total cost of the project is okay so it's really and that changes over time so you just have to see what the numbers are at that time and some people against whatever should have been the the tariff people some people might bid aggressively and get the tariff to less than that okay so you're seeing tariff bids now at 230 and above that's right that's, that's why right you but again that doesn't mean that people are not being aggressive it's just that the cost has gone i get it yeah. gst etc yeah. yeah. customs duty yeah. bunting you're now seeing bids at 230 and above that's right. as a result of these higher yes. costs and yes. you expect that they will continue to escalate And not necessarily. Because what does it mean for not grid necessarily. power? Then? Not necessarily. No, it doesn't mean anything. Because see, look, uh, coal-based power. Keep in mind that coal prices have also gone up to double of what yes. they were earlier, right? Yes. Uh, so all energy prices but have gone up. But we have. Well, I know we are currently facing a shortage. Yeah. But we are the second largest reserve of coal, right? I know, but so, mining it and getting it out of the ground is very hard. Okay. So in the short term, you have to import to meet temporary shortfalls. Yes. And that is therefore higher costs, and that's why you know there's a whole question of blending and all of that. that is being discussed which is really a way of saying look let everybody bear the extra input higher input cost right um so look energy prices globally have gone up there is inflation right that's very clear so it is also therefore a given that solar and wind prices or renewable energy prices will also go up but the relative differential hmm. with other energy sources is still as much as it was earlier so there's still much commercially better options for people especially because prices are fixed for 25 years Okay, so one final question: We have a ambitious target in India, mm-hmm. you know, for our renewable energy contribution to the overall mix. How are we? How do you assess our progress towards that target? We're somewhat short, mm-hmm. but you know, we still have come a very, very long way. How do you assess the infrastructure to be able to support this ambition India has to make renewable? Uh, a very important yeah. part of the mix my yeah. infrastructure i mean grids storage yeah, yeah, all of that yeah. right yeah so look that's uh, something that we grapple with on a daily basis i think look land acquisition is always a problem in india and not that it's a problem uh, you know not uh, that it's not a problem anywhere else it is but of course it is in india as well so that always puts a little bit of constraint on how rapidly you can grow transmission build out is also happening but again there are some issues that sometimes slow things down and so that slows down capacity addition and then of course the whole center state issue uh you know uh, we need better coordination um states need to be as progressive as the central government is on deploying more renewables faster and then finally of course the big daddy of them all is the issue of the distribution utility yes <laughs> which, which ultimately has not but you're going to fixed. have to answer that one for me because we keep you know all power problems get sort of swept under that carpet no that's and, right, and, yeah. and the problem yeah. is it has plagued conventional energy for yeah. decades yeah. if it's going to plague renewable yeah. energy we will have made no change right so i i do tend to agree with you the, i think the only thing i would say is that the central government has come out of this unique innovation of creating the solar energy corporation of india right. and so our pts are now it's Yeah. Seki like has some, you know, has a constitutional sort of protection and that improves the credit quality for us substantially. Um and I think that's one good way for us not to have to have direct dealings with the discons. 
But nevertheless, if the fundamental improvement does not happen in discoms, because your then, payments come from discoms, I know. But ultimately, you know, uh, Seki has this. Are discoms paying on time? No, so discoms pay to Seki on time, and Seki pays us on time. So Seki is able to get Seki the discoms to, to fall in line. Yeah, is exactly, it? exactly. So that's actually a very big change that is underappreciated right now. Of course, old PPAs are still directly with the discom so okay. there of course we still have the so what issue that we did. of your power consumption it's now about 50 percent is with, with, with Seki. Seki. yeah yeah and going so forward most of it of is your gonna, revenues yeah are in, yeah. in a sense at least assured absolutely. from discom volatility absolutely. Absolutely. in that sense yes absolutely and going ahead that percentage that can only go keep, go up. exactly yeah. exactly okay so, great yeah. so this has been such a uh, interesting explanation because I think we all grapple with some of these questions mm. with renewable energy. Uh, but you were going to finish your answer with regards to India's progress towards its Yeah, so look, target. so I think therefore all of these are constraining factors, but I think there's enough interest, the market is large, uh, there is a clearly demand for power in India, and therefore the reality is that we'll, I think, end up getting very close to meeting the target. All right, thank you so much for your time here in Davos, and uh, thanks very much for speaking to us here at DQ Prime. Thank you so much. Monica. And I think we froze you. You froze me? Froze you. No, 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 no. Listen. Really cold. No, right? no, no. But after.